the road to liberation. Al-Aqsa flooded. flooded. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اصبروا وصابروا ورابطوا اصبروا وصابروا ورابطوا اصبروا وصابروا ورابطوا واتقوا الله واتقوا الله O believers, patiently endure, persevere, stand on God and be mindful of Allah so that you may be successful. Al-Quran Surah Ali Imran verse 200 As recited there by the martyred leader of the Islamic resistance movement Hamas, Ismail Haniya. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this special coverage here on Radio 786 100.4 FM Al-Aqsa Flood, the road to liberation. The location is Tehran, the Iranian capital, 31st July 2024, just around 2 a.m. local time. A missile most certainly fired by the Zionist regime, Israel, strikes a building, killing the Politburo chief of the Palestinian Islamic resistance movement Hamas, Ismail Haniya. He was 62 years old. A leader with an extensive history in the resistance, he has served in senior positions, including as the elected Prime Minister of Palestine in the 2006 Palestinian elections. Eventually, he would become and continue to lead under difficult and treacherous circumstances, which tested the unity of the Palestinian people. Surviving various assassination attempts by the Zionist entity, Haniya as leader of a people under the most brutal modern-day siege would go on to become an international face of resistance, resilience and defiance, moving from Gaza to Qatar and assuming the role of the Politburo chief of the Islamic resistance movement. During the Operation Al-Aqsa Flood launched by the resistance on the 7th of October 2023, He eventually became perhaps one of the key faces of the movement outside of Palestine, playing a key role in mediation efforts and the relentless struggle to achieve an end to the Zionist genocide against the Palestinians at the diplomatic level. He may have been outside of Palestine, but the Palestinian identity of Ismail Haniya's blood ran deep. A husband, father, fighter and leader, His family remained in Gaza at the cold face of the Zionist aggression. Not only did he sacrifice himself in the path of resistance for the liberation of Al-Quds and Palestine, but his family also rose to martyrdom. The Israeli occupation entity has deliberately targeted Haniya's family in its efforts to weaken their will. But they, like many Palestinian families, have persevered and strengthened their resolve to continue the fight for what is right and just. You're tuned in to special coverage here on Radio 786 on this occasion of the martyrdom of Ismail Haniya during the early hours of this morning in the Iranian capital, Tehran. Together with him, martyred in that operation, was Wasim Abu Shaban, his bodyguard and companion. There have been reactions from a number of resistance movements, including Hamas, who has suggested that this certainly changes the rules of engagement. To discuss this now, we are joined by Elijah, Elijah Mania, who is a Brussels-based veteran war correspondent and a senior political risk analyst with nearly 40 years of experience in covering West Asia. We welcome him now to the, this special coverage here on Radio 786. Elijah, good evening and thank you for joining us here on Radio 786. Thank you for having me. An important aspect of any military exercise is the calculation of risk. This attack did not only target the Politburo chief of Hamas, it also staged an attack on a foreign nation soil, in this case Iran. And we've seen this sort of action from the Zionist entity with the strike earlier on the Iranian mission in Syria. Did Israel miscalculate here? 
I don't think Israel is miscalculating. Israel is looking for a wider war, trying to drag Iran and the rest of the axis of the resistance into a war by pulling also the Americans and the West into it. Now there is nobody who is ruling the White House. President Joe Biden is not fully in control. Those who are leading the country are the Secretary of State, um, Anthony Blinken, and the uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. And all the others are managing the country as they can. They're not a president, and the president seems not active all the time. So it's basically Benjamin Netanyahu who's leading the game. Even if this American administration is busy in the presidential elections, Benjamin Netanyahu is fully aware of the handicap of the administration and is pulling it by force to defend Israel whenever Israel wants to widen the war because Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is in domestic difficulties. He's not managing to control 364 square kilometers that represent the Gaza Strip, and his army is incapable of uh, defeating the resistance. So he is directing himself toward attacking Tehran by assassinating one of the members, the leaders of the axis of the resistance, Ismail Haniye. He's attacking Beirut. And uh, in the capital, the suburb of Beirut in Hat Hraik, uh, the Americans yesterday attacked also uh, Hashti Shabi in Baghdad, Iraq. And then uh, the, a few days ago, Benjamin Netanyahu attacked Hodeida in Yemen. Mm -hmm. So these messages across all the members of the Axis of the Resistance is extremely provocative to a wider war. Now it is up to the axis of the resistance to respond, and it, the response will happen, but it will happen coordinated in a way for the Israelis either to be deterred and not do it again, or to enlarge the war in case Israel would retaliate. There is that timeline that you talk about, these multiple attacks on all of the key resistance movements within the region that have been engaged in the struggle for the end and the liberation of the Gaza Strip. This, however, came after Benjamin Netanyahu's visit to the United States. During that period, Israeli media were reporting that he had been he had received the green light for the expansion, particularly as far as Lebanon is concerned. Do you think that what we see playing out here with this assassination on Ismail Haniya as well as the one in Beirut, which again Zionist media indicated the Americans were aware of, not necessarily the time and the place, but at least that the target was uh, uh, locked in by the Zionist entity. Does this give us a clearer indication in terms of this green lighting from the United States and that particularly there might be an appetite for some sort of expansion from its side? Well, I think it gives us even more than that. The Americans sent a message to Lebanon several days ago that Israel will not hit Beirut neither the suburb, uh, suburb of Beirut nor the airport. So that was a lie because the Americans told us they were aware of the attack against one of the top Hezbollah commanders in Beirut. Mm -hmm. So it is not attacking Beirut, but also attacking a commander of Hezbollah and killing many civilians. And uh, I think the Americans um, maybe thinks that Iran will retaliate as it has done when its consulate was attacked in Damascus. I think this time they are really misreading the axis of the resistance, including Iran's at retaliation, because this time there will be no warning. The attack would be coordinated and would come also uh, from the Lebanese borders without giving the Israelis the time to retaliate or to intercept, neither for the Americans to support the Israelis, which are already supporting, they are already supporting the Israelis. They mm. are 
patrolling the Mediterranean. They are um, downing all the uh, drones and the missiles fired by Ansarullah in Yemen. And they are uh, hitting Ansarullah, the British and the Americans, which means that they offering all the support for Israel because Israel is weaker uh, than fighting against more than one front. But I think this time they are going to make a bigger mistake because this time they're going to do very little to support Israel. The delicate balancing act here is that the Zionist entity has been pushing for this escalation and expansion. The resistance movements have been showing an extensive element of restraint and they have been indicating that the main issue is the end to the hostilities and the aggression and the genocide that's taking place in Gaza. They do not want any form of escalation. However, with these developments, how will the resistance coalition be able to balance that reaction and response to this Zionist aggression, considering the balance of not expanding but sending that firm message? Uh, the fact that the axis of the resistance is dealing with such a brutal and immoral army that has not hesitated to commit war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide against the civilians of Gaza, killing and wounding more than 130 to 140,000 people, of which 70% are children and women, it is wise for the axis of the resistance to think carefully how to hit Israel to deter the Israelis, but at the same time, not to cause a fire back against their civilians, because the Israelis will not hesitate to start bombing indiscriminately the civilians, because the axis of the resistance is not dealing with proper human beings who can abide by the international laws, the Geneva Convention, the United Nations resolution, and already uh, Antonio Guterres, the United Nations Secretary General, consider Israel as a terrorist nation because it is equal to Al-Qaeda and ISIS for all or the crime that is committing. So the Israelis have nothing to lose, really. But not for that they should be left alone without being taught a harsh lesson. And the only harsh lesson is for Israel to feel threatened by its presence on Palestinian soil, occupying it. And for that, they need to feel the heat in its infrastructure that will be damaged in Haifa and Tel Aviv. Otherwise, it is in the interest of Benjamin Netanyahu to continue the war, waiting for Donald Trump to return to power and give him more free hand to kill as many more Palestinians as possible. As a veteran war correspondent, as a senior political risk analyst, uh, analyst here, the announcement from Yemen, from the Ansarullah movement, when they struck Tel Aviv and when Hodeida was particularly hit by the Zionist entity, was that we will react and it will not be a limited strike we are not like the brothers in Iran who had, of course, responded to the attack on the uh, Iranian mission in Damascus. We've also seen said Hassan Nasrullah's statement that if you dare to enter Lebanon, you will not have any tanks left. We have also had Iran, after that retaliation to the attack on its uh, mission in Damascus, saying that the next uh, incident, should there be such an attack, will not be a limited one. Are we now entering a phase of the unknown? Or can we somehow, based on the readings of how the resistance has been handling the situation thus far, can we make an assessment of what the type of reaction will be? I think the Israelis crossed all red lines and is no longer abiding by the rule of engagement. And because of that, uh, I think the resistance and the axis of the resistant members will go in the same way against the Israelis to bring it back to the rules of engagement. Mm. 
the key point here is how Israel is going to retaliate to the retaliation. If the Israelis want an all-out war, then they will go and attack again. And this is where we're going toward the unknown. Yes, I agree. And it will all depend on the assessment of Netanyahu, who is not facing enough opposition domestically, and the Knesset has gone into a three-month holiday. So he doesn't have any opposition at the moment for the next three months where he can act freely and do whatever he wants with the Israelis. But the reaction domestically, if the hit is hard enough, then maybe the society in Israel will no longer support him as it is supporting him today. But uh, unfortunately, I can say the Middle East is going a new toward a new phase where we don't know what is going to happen in the next days or weeks. At points like this, one doesn't want to be alarmist, but we also know that West Asia has always been a critical focal point for the major world powers. The United States has already issued a statement in which it says that it is ready to and will defend, in its words, Israel, should there be any form of retaliation. We saw this with the Iranian strike, where it was not just the United States, but even some of the Arab regimes that were standing ready to uh, protect the Zionist entity. This also comes on the back of the agreement that was brokered by the Chinese for unity among the Palestinians. When we look at the region and the developments that are now starting to unfold, is there a potential that this could expand into something much larger than the region and just the Zionist entity and the resistance coalition? It is not the advantage of the Americans to see a large war because the Americans will not know how this is going to end. Moreover, the Americans have military bases in Iraq and Syria and have other military bases spread around West Asia. They are setting ducks for the missiles of the axis of the resistance in case they want to actively participate overtly to the war. They are already helping Israel in offering ammunition, intelligence. 2,000 of the Delta troop are in Tel Aviv and experienced generals are working with the Israeli generals. So we understand that America is involved in this war. But will America be involved even more than it is current involvement? That's another thing, because then what's going to happen with the presidential elections? Is it going to be in favor of the Democrat that are ruling today? Or is it going to be counterproductive when the black bag with American soldiers return to America with soldiers killed by the axis of the resistance if the Americans want to participate to all the Israeli attacks against Lebanon or Iraq or Syria or even Iran. So all these are still um, question marks because it is not any advantage to, for the Americans to see the, the war is growing. This is why all the American officials will be running toward Tehran indirectly to mediate and Lebanon to ask for de-escalation. But it's not going to happen because uh, uh, the Americans are partners with the Israelis and the de-escalation will not teach the Israeli a lesson. Next time they will say, we found a very valuable target that is wanted by the US and by Israel. So uh, we are doing you, Washington, a favor by eliminating this target. It's not going to work like that because if Israel, Israel is not stopped, then it's going to continue the killing and the assassination and will go even further and beyond assassinating top commanders, but they will go to several top commanders to kill simultaneously. So it is time for Israel to be stopped, but without triggering a wider war and fall into the hand of Benjamin Netanyahu.
You're tuned into special coverage here on Radio 786 100.4 FM. This in light of the assassination by the Zionist entity of the Politburo chief of Hamas, Ismail Haniya, in the early hours of this morning in the Iranian capital, Tehran. We're also uh, currently working on some breaking news that is coming through concerning the fate of the Hezbollah leader and commander, Fuad Shukr, uh, who was, of course, targeted in an Israeli airstrike in the southern suburbs of Beirut last night. Do stay tuned as we will be keeping you up to date as soon as we've got exact confirmation on those details that are coming out at this point in time. Elijah, just looking at the fact that, as we've discussed here, Benjamin Netanyahu has been looking at this expansion. We've seen the performance of the Zionist entity's occupation forces in the Gaza Strip and its failure to achieve any of its goals since the launch of this latest aggression against the Palestinian people. The question then is how would this or how could any of this end for the Zionist regime if it if Benjamin Netanyahu does in fact get that expansion of this conflict, bringing in Lebanon, bringing in Iran, bringing in Yemen? Who will say that Israel is attacked on different fronts and that there is no way Israel is going to go through uh, a new or an early elections, which means securing his space and his place as a prime minister until October 2026, until the war ends. This is why he is rejecting any deal with the Palestinians in Gaza. And every time there is a delegation, he sabotages the negotiation and he introduces new elements. So for him, it is important to widen the war and it's important for him to continue as a prime minister. Otherwise, he will face charges of corruptions and he will be accountable for the failure of predicting the 7th of October and protecting the Zionist settlers. Mm -hmm. Elijah, I'd like to just turn our attention now to the actual strike on Ismail Haniya that took place in the early hours of this morning. And of course, if we look at social media, uh, of course, (laughs) not adhering to the standards of journalism or the tests and the measures that we put in place as journalists uh, to verify information. But of course, the conspiracy theories are now starting and a suggestion that Iran somehow may have had a hand in this assassination. Now, I'm not trying to give any credence to this, but you certainly do have information relating to some of the details, at least, of how Israel carried out this attack on Ismail Haniya. First of all, the Iranians have been at war with Israel since February 1979, when uh, the Islamic Republic invited Yasser Arafat and gave him the Israeli embassy and became the first embassy of Palestine in uh, Iran. And the same street was was called, and is still called, the Street of Palestine. Uh, Secondly, the Iranians do not interfere in other countries' affairs but they support the axis of the resistance when they ask for the support. And according to the Iranian constitution, 152-153, the Iranians are uh, offering themselves, binding themselves to support all the oppressed people around the world. And that is as Iran supported South Africa against the apartheid regime, uh, Venezuela, uh, the the uh, Lebanese during the 1982 invasion, uh, Syria when uh, the uh, West and NATO was planning uh, for a coup d'état, Turkey when it was against a coup d'état of uh, against President Erdogan, and Iraq when ISIS was in control of Iraq, and Yemen when Yemen needed support. They are the people who ask for the support. When Yasser Arafat went and signed the deal, the Oslo Agreement 1993 and the Oslo 2 1995, and he was promised to be given a state in 1999, Iran did not take a position of an enemy against Yasser Arafat. On the contrary, 
Iran said, I am willing to support those who want to continue to return their land from the oppressor. And in the year 2000, Yasser Arafat realized that he was uh, cheated by the Americans and that he will never get a state for the Palestinians. So he orchestrated the second intifada and asked Iran to be to supply him with weapons. And the Karen A ship was arrested by the Israelis while they were shipping weapons to the Palestinians, so they continued their struggles. When part of the Palestinians turned against President Bashar al-Assad in Syria, Iran did not turn its back to the Palestinians, and those who remained directed toward the liberation of Palestine continue receiving support from Iran because they became an organic part of Iran and Iran an organic part of them. So they are part of the national security of Iran that Iran cannot do without them and they cannot do without Iran. And they are the front line defending Iran and Iran is defending them. Mm -hmm. So killing uh, Ismail Haniye is counterproductive for the axis of the resistance and is giving a false tactical victory to Benjamin Netanyahu, the butcher, the killer, who is considered a war criminal by the ICC. How would Iran imagine to go and help Benjamin Netanyahu in killing Ismail Haniye, who is the political leader and who's killing, as all the non-state actors, they have a horizontal leadership where, where it's one leader that is removed or assassinated, another one will be appointed. And this is what is going to happen after Friday when Haniyeh will be buried. So it is only people who have no intelligence about how non-state actors operate and how their leadership operate. This is not the first time that Hamas loses a leader. Mm. Ahmed Yassin was killed in the past. Rantisi was killed. Uh, so many leaders... Uh, Ayash was killed in 96. So, so many leaders of Hamas were killed and military leaders and spiritual leaders and Hamas became stronger. So killing um, Ismail Haniye significantly as strategically speaking, it doesn't offer anything to Israel, but it offer a small tactical victory. Therefore, it, there is no point in saying well, Iran contributed or not in killing a personage that is not going to make any difference in the course of war against the Zionists in Palestine and in Lebanon. Indeed, and that's the note on which we will leave it for this evening. Elijah Mania, a Brussels-based veteran war correspondent, also a senior political risk analyst with nearly 40 years of experience in covering West Asia. Thank you very much for having joined us here on Radio 786 on the special coverage. Thank you for having me.